Benedict Arnold is America's most infamous traitor. His name has become synonymous with that of treachery and deceit. But without his bravery and courage, there would probably be no such thing as the United States today. And from Arnold's point of view, it was America that in fact betrayed him. This is Gwen Battaglia, and you're watching Benedict Arnold, the untold story of an American hero. In August of 1777, Arnold arrived at Saratoga, where he would contribute greatly to the battle that would become known as the turning point of the revolution. Immediately upon his arrival, the commander in charge, General Horatio Gates, began to treat Arnold like a lesser and inferior officer, much to Arnold's dismay. However, despite this, it is said that for a time the two were able to maintain a somewhat amicable relationship. Gates wanted the Americans to stay within their fortifications at Venice Heights. However, Arnold had noticed that the fortifications had one disastrous weakness. If the British were able to capture the hill slightly to the west of them, from atop it, the British would have free reign to use their artillery to shell into the American fort and completely leave the troops exposed. On September 19th, the British sought to take advantage of this weakness and moved out, beginning the first battle of Saratoga. Arnold insisted that men must be sent out to protect the heights. However, Gates didn't want to hear any of it. But eventually, after much discussion, he caved in and allowed Arnold to send a small group of men under General Daniel Morgan and out to the center. Morgan and his skirmishers fought from within the trees, battling the British center line, and were able to push back, push them back despite being outnumbered. Arnold now saw that a gap had emerged between the British left and the British center. If the Americans could push through the gap, they could flank the British and win the battle completely here and now. Arnold began directing more men into the battle to take advantage of this. He reinforced the center, and the British on the left noticed that the center was being pushed back, so they moved in to try and support their allies. Arnold, seeing this, continued to order more men to join the battle. Soon, what began as a small skirmish would begin to expand into a full-scale battle at Saratoga. The British across the line began to be pushed back as the Americans moved towards their flank. Sensing that the time for victory was near, Arnold called the last remaining troops inside the fortress to head out and support this assault. As the troops began to head out, Gates caught wind of what was happening. He became a rape and furious and he demanded that all troops stop entering the battle and that they obey his commands to protect the fortress. He withcalled the men back to the fort. This would prove to be a mistake, as now the British on the far right finally became aware of what was happening in the center and they moved, attacking the American flanks and pushing them from the battle completely. It is now understood that had Arnold continued to send men into the battle, it is extremely likely that he would have defeated the British right here. While the British had technically won the battle, their numbers had been crippled as they took overwhelming casualties and they failed to achieve their objective of securing the hills to the west of the fortifications. Following the battle, there was a complete breakdown between the relationship of Arnold and Gates. Gates would write a letter to Congress recording the battle where he almost completely omitted all of Arnold's contributions and took complete credit for the achievements to himself. He then filed this up by asking that Congress open a court martial investigation into Arnold for his breaching of orders. He then dismissed Arnold from his command. The soldiers who fought the battle almost unanimously credited Arnold with their victory, and so they all signed a letter which they sent to Congress, but Congress turned a deaf ear to their request. Arnold then wrote to Washington, asking that he be reassigned to another post where he could contribute more to the war for independence. Washington granted this request, but oddly enough, Arnold decided to stick around camp, where he spent his days drinking and complaining to any men who would care to lend their ear to him. Arnold was not done yet, in the Second Battle of Saratoga, he would truly demonstrate his bravery, courage, and willingness to lead men into battle against overwhelming odds. But Saratoga was not all that Arnold accomplished. He began his contribution to liberty at the very beginning of the war. In 1775, amidst rising tensions between the American colonists and the British, Arnold was elected to take charge of the local militia in Connecticut. Soon, the shot heard around the world was fired to the Battle of Lexington and Concord, officially beginning the struggle for American independence. 
The locals in Connecticut wanted to remain loyal to the crown and locked all their weapons inside a town safe house. Arnold rallied the populace. He stormed the safe house and armed his militia. He then quickly took them and led them in a race to Massachusetts to help aid in the coming battles for independence. As Arnold rode towards Boston, the Americans faced their first defeat of the war. They were attacked at the Isthmus of Bunker Hill and pushed back, losing the strategically important location. The Americans then resolved to put the city under siege, but lacking the artillery and the manpower necessary, they couldn't attack the city directly. Their only choice was to starve the city into submission, but the Americans had no navy, and so the British were able to constantly resupply the city by sea, meaning that the siege would in the end be fruitless. When Arnold made it to Boston, he observed the situation and knew the American situation was dire, but he had knowledge of a fort deep in British territory that had a bountiful supply of artillery, munitions, and supplies that could be used to win the siege. He informed the commissioner, and the commissioner gave Arnold a secret mission to ride out, take the fort, and help save the siege. Arnold went for the mission and rode so furiously that his horse died of exhaustion along the way. Ticonderoga was a strategically situated fortress in upstate New York. It defended the path from Lake Champlain down through Canada and into the 13 colonies. But at this point in history, it had become guarded by only a skeleton crew of British soldiers. Arnold raced off to attack Fort Ticonderoga, where he coincidentally met up with a group of militia who had the very same plan in mind. He informed them that he was charged by the American government to take the fort, and the leader of the militia and Arnold engaged in a small power struggle over who would lead the group. Eventually, they came to an amicable, bold decision, and the group led off as one to go and seize the fortress. On May 9th, Arnold led a daring nighttime raid of the fortress. His men crept over the walls and moved to the commander's sleeping quarters. They knocked on his door and awoke him in the middle of the night. The commander, still in his underwear, was shocked to see the Americans and surrendered the entire fortress and all its equipment to Arnold without a single shot being fired. Not yet satisfied with his victory, Arnold learned that a warship was patrolling Lake Champlain. He had the locals provide their small trading crafts and rowboats and equip the cannons from Ticonderoga atop of them. Through daring and cunning, he ambushed the British warship and sunk it, securing the lake for the American cause. However, he did so at great risk to himself. His own ship was sunk, and he almost lost his life along with it. Victorious Arnold returned home, only to be bombarded with bad news. His beloved wife had died while he was away, and his business gone bankrupt. And now, Congress was refusing to give him a promotion, even though they candidly admitted that he deserved one. Congress did not want to promote too many officers from one state because they were engaged in a bitter power struggle. The fighting thus far had taken place largely in New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, and so those colonies already had their fair stare of officers. Washington wrote to Congress on Arnold's behalf, personally advocating for him, but this wasn't enough. In the midst of his despair, Arnold sent a demanding letter to Congress, demanding that he be promoted. This would not go over well, and it would cause Arnold to become blacklisted by Congress. Meanwhile, back in Boston, George Washington had taken command of the siege. There, he was planning on launching an invasion of Canada where they'd take the city of Quebec. It was then that Bandit Arnold personally approached him and requested that he be commissioned to lead a thousand men in a second prong invasion of the city. The attack would be dangerous and risky, but Washington believed Arnold was the one man who could pull it off, and so he granted Arnold his request. Arnold loaded his men into several small ships and traversed the heavily patrolled British seas defying all odds by making it into Canada without losing a single man. However, things soon started to go very sour for the invasion. The map which Arnold was relying upon had been sabotaged by a British engineer. Soon, his men got lost. They had to march over double the distance that they'd anticipated. They ran low on supplies, and many would die. Over half the men that Arnold had started off with would desert from the army before they made it to Quebec. Despite this, Arnold was determined to push onward. He encamped outside Quebec and awaited the second prong being led by General Montgomery. When Montgomery's men finally made it, the two armies had no artillery remaining and were desperately low on supplies. They determined that an attack must commence at once if there was to be any chance of success. During a blizzard in December, the two armies combined and launched an attack on the city. They were badly defeated, 
with General Montgomery being killed in action and Arnold being badly wounded. However, not all was going poorly for the Americans. The artillery, which Arnold had procured from Ticonderoga, finally made it to the Siege of Boston, and with them, Washington was able to launch a daring assault on Dorchester Heights and force the British to withdraw from the city. This major victory inspired many around the colonies to enlist the Continental Army and emboldened and encouraged Congress with the strength and fortitude to finally declare their independence in 1776, and it was all made possible by the efforts of Benedict Arnold. Back in Philadelphia, Congress finally decided to give Arnold a promotion, but it was only a small one, far below the rank which Arnold actually deserved. Viewing this as a slight and insult towards his honor, Arnold wrote to Washington officially resigning from the Continental Army. But Washington rejected Arnold's resignation. He told Arnold that if America was to prosper and be victorious in this war, they would need leaders such as him. And so Arnold decided to stay on and render even more service to liberty. Arnold continued leading militia and continental troops against the British over the next several years. All the while, Congress overlooked him for promotion time and time again. At the Battle of Bridgefield, he would be badly injured when he was shot fighting a much larger British force. For his valor, Congress finally granted him a promotion, but it was still one that was far beneath the rank that he truly deserved. Arnold wrote to Washington, resigning from his command again. But fate had different plans in store for him. The British had just launched an invasion of New York, and the Battle of Saratoga was soon to commence. Washington wrote back, telling Arnold that he'd be desperately needed in the defense of New York. And Arnold, duty bound, answered Washington's call to defend liberty. Arnold arrived in New York following the victory of the British at Saratoga. The British were launching a three-pronged attack towards Albany. The western prong had been gaining steam gaining victory at the Battle of Oriskany before laying siege to the Americans at Fort Stanwix. The British force was likely too large for Arnold to be able to defeat, and so instead he began spreading rumors throughout New York that his army was double the size that actually was. These rumors reached the British and their Native American allies who were besieging the fort. Wanting to gain favor with whoever they thought would be victorious, the natives broke off from the British force and began attacking them instead. This forced the entire division of the Western British force to have to retreat back to Lake Erie, completely taking them out of the battle without costing Arnold the life of a single man under his command. When the Second Battle of Saratoga began, it is said that Arnold was heavily inebriated. He listened to the sounds of battle, and he could hear the Americans were winning. After around an hour, the sounds of the battle drastically changed. Once again, Gates was refusing to send additional men into the fight at a crucial moment. Enraged, Arnold mounted his horse and raced to the battlefield. Seeing the Americans falling back, he charged out in front of them, drew his sword, and rushed a British fortified position. The Americans quickly reversed direction and followed behind Arnold. They swiftly took the position. To the west, the rest of the American lines had entered a stalemate while trying to assault a series of British redoubts. Arnold turned his horse and raced between the center of thousands of American and British troops who were exchanging fire. There was said to be utter astonishment on both sides that he was not killed. Arnold, reaching the other side of the battlefield, demanded that a small regiment of Americans follow his lead. He took them in a flanking attack on the British positions, utterly breaking their defenses and leading to the victory that would become the turning point of the war. In the battle, Arnold was badly injured after being shot in both legs. Once again, Gates wrote to Congress, completely omitting Arnold's contributions to the battlefield that day, thus stripping him of the honor and merit that he'd earned. But Washington and the men at the battle knew what Arnold had done, and for a reward, he was promoted and sent to run the city of Philadelphia as the military governor. While in Philadelphia, Arnold was charged with a court-martial based on politically motivated charges from Congress. He defended all but two of the 15 charges levied against him, but in the end, he was ordered to pay Congress a vast sum of money as reparations for his supposed crimes. This would prove to be the last straw for Arnold. Desperately broke from the war, and with Congress unwilling to pay his salary and now demanding that he instead pay them, Arnold moved to treason. And it's there that his plot to steal West Point and give it to the British began. But that, my friends, is a topic for another video. Come back next week to hear about the plot of Bandit Arnold to steal West Point. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, or subscribe to show your support for the channel. And as always, please never stop learning.